welcome to Orthodox Shahada again. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you are. Um, today we're having a great discussion about God and creation. I've brought eminent Orthodox scholar Dr. Bradshaw. Uh, Dr. David Bradshaw, he's a professor at uh, University of Kentucky of Philosophy. He's well known for his book, uh, Aristotle East and West, which we always highly uh, recommend to anyone who's interested in the essence energy's distinction and the history of uh, the concept of energy energy um and then we also have uh jake who's been on here before uh jake's a muslim apologist from the us he has a background in analytic philosophy and he has special interests in the trinity and christology um and basically um we're just gonna have a discussion here and compare the islamic view of, of god and his relation to creation and the christian one or the orthodox christian one um so I'll let um, Dr. Bradshaw uh, kick off with his um, introduction to what, uh, what the Orthodox or Christian conception is. And then um, uh, Jake can jump in and there'll be a, a back and forth. And then we'll do a Q&A after about an hour and 10 minutes. Yeah. Great. Um, just to make sure I understand the, the question, the topic, uh, do you want me to talk more about the orthodox view of creation or the essence energies distinction or a little of both just yeah, a little of both like god's activity in creation and creation itself yeah mm -hmm. dr energy, bradshaw yeah. i think maybe it would be a good place to start with the essence energy distinction because it's kind of more broad and then go into specifics from there okay okay sure um yeah the essence energies distinction of course is one of the things that's um, but relatively distinct to Orthodox, even compared to Catholic and Protestant Christianity. Um, so it's a good place to start. And then I, I can say a little bit about how that affects the understanding of creation. Um, so the word energy is just uh, really a transliteration of the Greek word energia that was coined by Aristotle. And you can find him using it prolifically in the metaphysics, in physics, metaphysics, Nicomachean ethics, elsewhere. Um, but in Aristotle, it's rarely translated energy. It's translated either activity or actuality, depending on the context. And um, if you think about how the word originates, N plus ergon, work or deed, so to be at work, um, and you can see how the concept of activity is sort of implied within that. It's really a term that Aristotle originated when he wanted to talk about actively using a power, uh, a capacity that one has as distinct from merely possessing that capacity. And so you can go back to his early works like the Protrepticus and you can find him using the distinction in that way. But it's a short step from that to uh, a broader concept of actuality uh, as distinct from only activity. In other words, activity is really just a kind of actuality. It's the actual performance and employment of a, of a, of a capacity to act. But there can be other kinds of actuality, such as, uh, of course, one that's very important for Aristotle, mm -hmm. form. Uh, form is not an activity, but it is a kind of actuality um, in other words, the form is what makes the thing be actually what it is. Um, the form of the house, you know, that's a standard example he uses. You may have the, the bricks and the wood and so forth there, but it's only when they're put together following the form of a house that uh, you actually have a house. So form is actuality, whereas matter is just potentiality. Uh, that's a, a major theme in the metaphysics. So... Anyway, these are terms that he uses uh, extensively. And one of the key points in Aristotle, I spent a chapter on this in the book, is where he sort of unifies and synthesizes those two different concepts of energia, activity, and actuality in his account of the prime mover in Metaphysics Lambda, where the prime mover is you know, pure actuality, his, his essence, or, is his usia is energia that's from uh, lambda six and if you ask well what does energia mean there i think initially it uh it's natural to take it as actuality because it's that's in a context where he's 
he's arguing that the, that the prime mover has no unrealized capacities, all right? So the prime mover is pure actuality in that sense. But as you keep reading in chapter seven, and again, chapter nine, he has a lot to say also about what the prime mover does, namely self-thinking thought. You know, that famous account uh, of intellect that thinks itself and is fully identical with its own activity of thought. And so there the energia is activity as well. So in other words, the prime mover is pure energia in both of those senses, actuality, activity, or another way to put that is that the prime mover is sort of fully realized, fully actual, self-subsistent activity, the activity of thinking. So it's a really uh, powerful and uh, metaphysically deep uh, conception of God as a kind of a self-sustaining, self existing activity of thought that through its activity of thinking enables everything else to be actual to the extent that it is. And that's that's especially what comes out in chapter 10 in Lambda where he talks about how the prime mover is the good that everything is seeking. So uh, you have that already in Aristotle, this application of energia to the divine, a kind of divine activity in Aristotle, it's limited to the activity of self-thinking thought, but nonetheless, that divine activity is, in a sense, you might say, present everywhere and enables everything to be what it is, because uh, one thing that's important in Aristotle's metaphysics is that uh, form exists most fully and at the highest level of actuality when it is uh, actually cognized by the mind. All right, prior to that, it's only potentially cognized. So there's, it's sort of at a lower level of existence in a sense. And then when it's actually understood, then uh, it's raised by the mind sort of to that highest level of actuality. And so all form exists in the thought of the prime mover uh, as fully actual. Now it doesn't exist as distinct forms, form A, form B, form C, because the prime mover thinks it as a single, eternal, uh, simple act of thought. But nonetheless, all form is present there and is at least potentially uh, distinct. So um, what that implies for sort of creation, or of course Aristotle doesn't call it creation, but the sensible world, the cosmos, is that um, everything insofar as it thinks seeks to realize its own form, which is the way Aristotle understands natural processes there, you know, his, his account of teleology and the physics, um, everything is seeking to realize its nature or its, its form. Well, what it's doing is in a, in a sense, uh, you know, seeking to be what the prime mover already is. And it's the fact that that form already exists fully realized in the prime mover that um, enables that process to occur. Now, enables in a very kind of indirect way because we're not talking here about direct agency or you know causal agency, uh, uh, nor much less a, about an act of creation. The, the cosmos is eternal; it's always existed. But nonetheless, the prime mover, by being fully actual, enables other things to. Uh, it's sort of the linchpin that ties everything together, and that again is what you find in, in Lambda 10. So, uh, so that's why I say in Aristotle already, you have a concept of divine activity, uh, self-thinking thought, that even though it's sort of self-thinking, it's not, it, its implications, its importance doesn't end with God, it extends through everything and enables everything else to be what it is. Now, uh, that I think is why you know, later when you get to biblical authors or even authors of, of even Hellenistic Judaism, uh, as well as uh, St. Paul in the New Testament, they really like this word, energia. They really kind of uh, elevate it to a certain prominence. And in St. Paul especially, it's very striking. If you study this word group of energia, plus there's an associated verb, energain, which is usually act, translated to be active or to be at work, um, and that has a passive voice as well, energesthai. Um, he uses those terms about two dozen times in the New Testament. And it's very striking that he uses those terms 
only for supernatural agency, God, or in some cases, Satan or Christ or the Holy Spirit. But in every case, it's, it's, it's a supernatural agent who's involved. And I think what's going on there is that Paul has sort of latched onto this word group because it had already from Aristotle and its prior history, that connotation of a form of divine activity that, that is present in other things, enabling them to be what they are. And in a sense, uh, sort of working through them. Now, that's not something Aristotle ever says. But if you're, um, you know, someone who believes in the biblical God, the God of the Old Testament, the way that uh, Paul does, then you understand divine activity to be more than just self-thinking thought. All right. It also includes many other things, you know, uh, creation to begin with, and also uh, miraculous acts, interventions in, in human history, and even prophetic inspiration acting within the human soul uh, to move us, even though we're free agents. Nonetheless, we're, we're sort of open to influence from God. So um, when Paul uses these words, it's, it's very interesting. It's, it's, you kind of have to read it in the Greek, I think, because most English translations don't convey this very well. Um, so I, I, you know, there, I give you many examples of that in my book in chapter six, but just to mention a couple, uh, Colossians 129, he refers to himself and his own ministry of, of preaching and so forth. He, he says that what is happening is that the energia of Christ is being energumene, and that is realized and made effective within him. Okay, the activity of Christ is at work within him, within his own free actions. In, in his ministry. And uh, there's a lot implied there. I mean, because he's not saying that, that, that I, Paul, am just a puppet, you know, or I'm just a sort of an inanimate object that God is using. Um, he's describing his own free actions, yet his free actions are also God's actions. Okay, so this is um, what's often referred to as synergy. But even that word, I think it can be a little misleading because synergy often is translated just cooperation, and we naturally think of two independent agents that work together, you know, like the three of us are cooperating right now on this broadcast. Um, but that's not what Paul is describing. It's uh, an agent who, the divine agent, who by his activity enables the creature to act and to be what it is. Okay, but that does not in any way diminish that this is the free agency of the creature uh, and that the creature being a rational agent has free will. Um, and so um, uh, another example of that, uh, uh, Philippians 2, 12 to 13, a really interesting passage where Paul uh, is addressing the Philippians and he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who is at work with you, O Energon, that's the verb again, it's the participle of the verb, the one who is working within you, both to will and to do, Energain, it's the infinitive, of his good pleasure. So God is working in them to do. Now you have to ask, well, to do, who's doing? Is that God doing or the Philippians doing? And the answer is it's both, because again, this is synergy. To will and to do of his good pleasure the ones who are doing are the Philippians, yes, but what they are doing is is God's will and God's activity. So that again, a, another example of, of that Pauline concept of synergy. Um, well, okay, so one other piece of evidence that um, this is an important concept in St. Paul is that if you look then at early Christian literature, like the Apostolic Fathers and the Greek Apologists in the second century, they too use this word group almost exclusively for supernatural agents, um, uh, which is all very different from what had been the case earlier in Greek, uh, where the word was used, you know, kind of for anything that's active or acting. Uh, it becomes in Christian theology almost a technical term for supernatural agency as it is present and active within a creature, enabling that creature to do new things or to act in new ways. And 
uh, uh, one example of that would be uh, that I, I think I put this in the book, the Apostolic Constitutions um, has a, a passage where he's kind of writing in the voice of one of the apostles at on the day of Pentecost. And the way he describes that, those tongues of flame at Pentecost, he says, we were filled with God's energy and we spoke with new tongues, all right? So that the gift of tongues was seen as a form of divine energy that they received at Pentecost. And it's not only divine energy, it can also be demonic or satanic. And in fact, in the uh, Greek apologists, that's probably the most prominent use of the word because they were so keenly aware of the pagan gods being demons and of demonic activity uh, permeating their culture all around them. And the, what, what, what was done at the pagan temples was demonic. And so they saw uh, those pagan rituals as forms of sort of synergy, you might say, but demonic synergy. Um, so anyway, that, that word group is there already in those early centuries, uh, very prominent. If, you have to kind of go look for it because people in the English translations, they don't pick up on this. They think it's just, you know, again, to work or be, to be active and so on. Um, but in the book and some of my articles, I've made a case that no, we have really here a coherent uh, systematic development. And um, what makes it possible is again, that Aristotelian conception of energia as a divine activity that can be present and active in creatures. So um, how does that all relate to creation? Um, well, uh, let me just go a little further historically with the energies and that concept because it becomes over time as, as successive church fathers make use of this concept uh, something that they sort of apply and draw upon in, in various contexts um, so one of the most important would be Dionysius the Areopagite uh, who of course is a Neoplatonist he's read Plotinus he's read Proclus he picks up from uh, the pagan Neoplatonists that key term procession, proodos in Greek. Uh, you know, a big part of Neoplatonism is this concept of remaining procession and return, that every cause, that is every, you know, spiritual or intelligible cause, when, they, when the Neoplatonists talk about cause, they're talking about the one or intellect or soul, typically, or nature. Um, it both... Uh, remains in itself, proceeds, and returns to itself. Uh, so uh, remaining, mone, procession, proodos, uh, return, epistrophe, are those three classic moments uh, sort of that the Neoplatonists will work with and distinguish. And for Dionysius, uh, he applies that to God, that God in a sense sort of remains within himself. He has his full integral self-identity that is in no way uh, disrupted or diminished uh, by creation. But nonetheless, he also gives of himself through what Dionysius calls the divine processions. Um, and you know, in his work, The Divine Names, what he explains is that every divine name is really the name of a divine procession. And the whole structure of the book is to go through these processions in order, beginning with God as the good, uh, goodness as a divine procession, and he kind of groups that with beauty as well, and uh, beauty being a form of goodness, and then even with love, uh, including both agape and eros. Uh, so it's one of the most interesting things in Dionysius is that, you know, the notion that God is love, that's biblical, that's in First John, God is agape. But eros, or Dionysius rather uh, expands that to add that God is eros, as well, which is not a biblical term. It's a term that I think Christian authors sort of shied away from because it had pagan associations. Eros was a pagan god. Uh, but by the time he's writing, uh, that's less the case. You know, Christianity is is sort of secure in its triumph over paganism. So um, he says God is Eros. Um, god is good, seeking good for the sake of the good. That's how he defines the divine Eros. Uh, in chapter four of the divine names. Anyway, so that's all a divine procession, um, a way in which God gives himself as the good, as the beautiful, as divine love 
to creatures. That's the first divine procession. Then the next one is being, that's chapter five in the divine names. And you might say, well, this is kind of crazy because how can good be prior to being? Um, and what are we talking about? We're talking about things that maybe don't even have being. Um, well, um, if, again, if you know Neoplatonism, you know that the one is also the good and being only sort of arises at the, at the level of the second hypostasis, intellect. Um, and by being, what the Neoplatonist typical mean is, is um, usia, or in other words, something that has form and limit and boundary and definition. And the one has none of those. The one transcends form and all boundary and limit. So it is beyond being. You know, that's the idea they pick up from the, the Republic, the myth of the sun and the Republic, that the good is beyond being. And so Dionysius is using some of those same concepts uh, to make being the second procession. And what he says is that uh, the procession of the good reaches to the things, both the things that are and the things that are not. Whereas the procession of being reaches only to things that are. And then the next procession is life that reaches only to things that uh, both are and have life. And then the next procession after that is wisdom or a uh, really rational capacity and that reach, reaches to things that are and have life and have reason. So you have a successive narrowing of scope among these processions. Um, and then there are further processions after that like power and unity uh, and even uh, things like sameness and difference and so on, he sort of treats as processions. But the, the really interesting point is that the procession of the good reaches not only the things that are, but even the things that are not. And I take that to mean uh, be his way of referring to what in modern philosophy we might refer to as possibilia, in other words, things that could have existed but do not, uh, things God could have created but did not. Um, they too are good. In other words, that anything God could make would be good because God is the good and there can be nothing evil coming from God. Um, and of course, later, or, or in chapter four, actually, of the divine names, Dionysius elaborates and develops the whole privation theory of evil, kind of to go with that. So anyway, um, that's a kind of an implicit theory of creation, in a sense, um, that God is the good and can produce many, many things, probably an infinite range of things. And from among them, only some does he, uh, to some does he impart being. Okay, and so that's, that's where the divine procession of being comes into play. And among those, to some he imparts uh, life, and to some even smaller set, he imparts also reason and so forth. Uh, and of course, these are not successive acts. What he's describing here uh, is rather the different forms of divine activity that are present in different ways among creatures. So, um, he, he thinks of creation as this, at least in one way that he thinks of it, I guess, is sort of this relationship in which God is always actively present, shaping creatures as what they are through these different forms of divine activity, goodness, beauty, being, life, wisdom, and so on. Um, and the ways he's present in each creature are unique ultimately to that creature. Um, but nonetheless, we can sort of group them under these main headings. And um, you might wonder then, well, so is Dionysius so much of a Neoplatonist that for him this is all an eternal relation, kind of like it is for Plotinus or Proclus, and there's no act of creation distinctly. Um, I, I wrote an article, um, it's called uh, D Divine Freedom in the Greek Patristic Tradition. Uh, you can find it online. Um, in which uh, I argue actually no, that he, Dionysius is actually quite orthodox on that issue, that he, like all the other church fathers before him, believed that God created at a distinct moment in the past. Um, and, uh, you know, he refers, in fact, like I mentioned, to there being many things God could have created that he did not. Um, and so uh, he, I think he refers at one point to uh, Moses' account of the seven days, and he seems to take that at face value, which would imply a distinct sort of moment of the beginning of time. 
Uh, but he's much less explicit about, about all that than many other fathers are, and that's true. Um, and there have been people who did read him as just an emanationist, but I, I argue against that in that paper. Um, anyway, so creation then, um, I think I need to wrap this up. So in, in Dionysius is sort of emblematic of the way this whole tradition develops, that um, creation is an act God performs, but it's not over, or at least, how should I put this, God's activity in, cre in creatures is never over. Um, there's, a, there's a verse in the Gospel of John where Jesus says, uh, my father works and I work. And they would often interpret that as referring to God's continual activity within creation that is always present, enabling and, and making constituting creatures as what they are. And the only sort of counterpoint or limitation upon that is the fact that rational creatures, because they also have free will, have uh, the freedom to reject God's ongoing activity and um, the ways in which God seeks to sort of lead them to the good. Um, but otherwise, all of creation is the, is the result of God's action. So um, uh, let me just stop there. Uh, I'm sure there's more we need to talk about, but that's that may be enough to kick it off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I appreciate the explanation now. From my understanding that this is a somewhat of a divide uh, between the East and the West in the Christian tradition as far as the distinction between the essence of God and his energies and things of that sort. And so I'm wondering from you, um, why you think that this distinction is so important to make as a Christian and what the consequences might be of not making that. Uh, in my understanding, it would seem to be problematic for God's freedom and God to be personal if you weren't able to make that distinction properly. And do you see that as the two fundamental problems with it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. Um, I mean, I hate to, uh, <laughs> a lot of people didn't like my book, as you may know, because they saw it as bashing uh, <laughs> Aquinas and, and Western Christian theology in general. Um, and, you know, you always want to respect people's intent and what they're sort of, what they're trying to say, maybe as opposed to what they actually do say. Uh, mm -hmm. Clearly, I mean, the Western Christian tradition has a strong commitment to divine freedom and to God being a personal reality. I don't think anyone questions that. Uh, the issue is always, you know, is your philosophical theology sufficient to really capture what you want to say about God? Or is it going to import uh, philosophical premises and maybe implications that you really don't want to be there. You know, you never intended, but there they are because that's the nature of philosophy. You know, once you adopt a position, it has consequences um, that will follow logically. So um, that is kind of what I think happened in a lot of Western Christian theology, that because they did not have this distinction, they end up identifying um, the divine essence with God's will and activity. Um, and that's actually already there in Augustine. Uh, Augustine in the Confessions, I think there are three separate passages where he identifies God's essence and will. And, you know, he infers from that such things, you know, in, uh, for instance, that because God's essence is eternal and necessary, therefore his will is eternal and necessary. Uh, well, that's huge. And it's also very problematic. Um, you know, how can the... How can it be then that God chooses to create and that he chooses what to create and that he could have created things differently? And it's, you know, I think it's no accident. Now, I mean, I don't want to put words in Augustine's mouth. You know, he's a great church father, but OK, I'm not the only person to have noticed this. Um, if you look at his early work, uh, De Libero Arbitrio, uh, book three, chapter five, there's a really interesting discussion there where he essentially argues that. Um, God must of the necessity of his own nature, uh, his own goodness, his own lack of jealousy in, re in relation to creatures, create all that he can. Um, and we can know this, you know, a priori. We can, we can sort of by investigating the divine reasons, the divine 
uh, rationos that are present to our mind, we can know what God created even independently of any kind of empirical uh, uh, investigation, uh, such as the angels. He thinks, you know, we can know God must have made angels because it's just that was the rational and good thing to do, and therefore he must have done it. Um, so I, I, I think that sort of goes hand in hand with this Augustinian understanding of divine simplicity where the, God's essence and will are just different names for the same reality. Um, and then, uh, you know, God's activity, uh, that's not quite explicit in Augustine, but actually it is in Boethius, you know, another early Latin author. He says that God's essence and his operatio, his operation or activity are, are the same. Um, so you have that, you know, in these foundational authors of the Western Christian tradition. And, uh, you know, what I argue in the book is that it really is a problem. Uh, and you can see Aquinas kind of wrestling with this problem and, um, uh, in my opinion, uh, not successfully. Um, but at least he recognizes there's a problem here, you know, that this is really an issue for that whole way of thinking. Uh, and the essence energies distinction just kind of circumvents that whole issue because, no, we're not identifying God's essence with his will or his activity. That's the whole point is to say that they're distinct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would just say that we have a similar um, divide in the Islamic theology, and that's between the traditional school of the Ash'aris and Mataridis and even the Hanbalis on the one hand and a group that was called the Mu'tazilis. And so they also had a very strong view of absolute divine simplicity, very similar to uh, what you have in figures like Aquinas and obviously going all the way back to Aristotle. And I think the issue is that um, for both in the Western Christian tradition with figures like Aquinas and then also with this early group of the Maltesides, they don't really even exist that much anymore just as like uh, a few followers here and there but not in any significant degree but for this early group they borrow a lot from aristotle obviously and in many ways their theology and their the metaphysics behind underpinning the system were just incompatible with the scripture and uh largely with the theology at hand and so I think that we, in this instance, broadly speaking, are in agreement that this was sort of a fob off of Aristotle that these groups never were able to quite get rid of. And so they were always in tension with the um, scripture and the traditional understanding of who God is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I could definitely see that. I mean, I mean, as you know, one of the one of the huge influences in early Islamic philosophy was the um, theology of Aristotle, uh, which is this uh, kind of hybrid work that's really stitched together out of Plotinus, the Aeneids, um, and they passed it off under the name of Aristotle. So the people all read Aristotle as being essentially a Platinian emanationist. <laughs> um, and there's not a lot of divine freedom in that work or, or in that no more than there is in Plotinus or in Aristotle right. himself. You know, they, none of them really consider divine freedom to be uh, an issue or a priority because they don't believe in a personal God. Um, right, right. Right. So, yeah, mm -hmm. it's just a, a basic problem you're going to run into if you try to take those Greek philosophical patterns and kind of just transfer them over wholesale onto either Islam or Christianity. Um, mm -hmm. It's not going to work too well. Um, right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm, I know um, Ghazali was, uh, was he an Asherite himself or just? Uh, yes. He was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, you know, he's he's really brilliant on this whole issue because he, he goes after um, Ibn Sina just hammer and tongs, you know, and just bashes him to bits over uh, <laughs> Ibn Sina's uh, emanationist system. And Ghazali points out how arbitrary it is to think that the whole universe, with all of its detail, um, could could somehow just be necessary. Um, you know, it's just kind of insane, uh, unless you're really driven to that by some very strong prior philosophical principles. Right. So, yeah. 
Right, I agree. Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, the only people that really held this view in the Islamic tradition were the, the early group of the Mu'tazilis. Um, some of the philosophers, like you mentioned, like uh, Ibn Sina, Ibn Rushd, um, these are generally are the only figures that really held this view, and they were largely condemned for sort of mixing, you know, ancient Greek thought in figures like Aristotle and uh, even Neoplatonism um, for doing that. It just seems to be totally at odds with the idea of a God that's free and personal. And I just don't see any way around it. I, it's almost hard for me to imagine how some of these figures that were, you know, brilliant minds couldn't see how difficult it was to mash these two ideas together. Um, but it's nevertheless it's really interesting how they thought they could make it work in some sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so um, uh, if you don't mind, let me, let me ask you if you have any um, thoughts about the essence energies distinction as to, I mean, clearly there's a lot of agreement here about divine mm -hmm. freedom. Mm -hmm. um, so far as I'm aware, you know, and I've only read more of the early Islamic philosophy, Ibn Sina, Ghazali, mm -hmm. uh, Ibn Um I don't know of anything in them that would kind of correspond to this essence energies distinction. Yeah, um, I mean, part of the yeah. problem, as you know, Dr. Bradshaw, even mm -hmm. with your book, deals a lot with the language and uh, tr you know translating things from the Greek to the Latin and whole issues with East and West. So it's even more difficult to try to do it when use, you know, trying to compare the Eastern tradition and Christianity with Arabic. And so a lot yeah. of it is not so easy to always match things up because generally speaking, you won't really find terms like energy or a correlate for that. Usually we just have the understanding of attributes, which would be you know, more related to what you would find in the Western tradition, although um, they largely don't even, in my opinion, <laughs> they don't really even believe in attributes because all the attributes are just identical to, in, at least in Aquinas anyway, they're all identical to each other and all identical to the essence. Whereas for us, um, there's a difference of opinion on exactly how many attributes there are. But generally speaking, there's at least seven or eight, and they are real uh, attributes. They're not identical to each other, and they're not identical to the essence. And so I think there's some room where we would agree on. Now, the finer details of how all of that works out, there may be a departure in certain places. I know that you actually uh, wrote a paper on this uh, comparing figures in the Christian tradition and the Islamic and the, even the Jewish uh, tradition. And towards the end, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when you wound up uh, finishing your survey on the Islamic um, tradition, you seem to think that Ibn Arabi um, mm -hmm. and generally, more broadly speaking, the Sufi tradition um, was more closely related to uh, the Eastern Orthodox perspective. So maybe you uh, could say a little bit about that and, you know, your understanding of that. Yeah, well, uh, uh, it's been 10 years since I wrote that paper, so I've got to <laughs> apologize for not having this on the top of my, on my mind. But uh, mm -hmm. as I understand him, so Ibn al-Arbi has this concept of divine names. Let me just, if you don't mind, maybe I could just read a few sentences from that paper because yeah, this sure. is what I was trying to look, review and I didn't quite get to it. So let me just see if I can. Um, he's so Al -Ar Ibn Al Ibn Arabi has sometimes been accused of pantheism, for he teaches that God is the subsistence of all things, or more radically, that quote, there is none in existence but God. Okay, you can see how that might be taken as pantheistic. However, such statements must be understood in light of his understanding of creation or emanation, terms he uses interchangeably. For Ibn Arabi, creation is an act of divine self-manifestation in which God shows forth his otherwise unknowable and unlimited being in voluntarily self-limited ways. He frequently quotes in this vein the hadith in which God proclaims, uh, I created in order that I might be known. 
the unknowable transcendent reality of God is the divine essence or unity, whereas the divine manifestation within various forms of perfection is the divine attributes or names. I mean, that sounds a lot like Dionysius to me. Um, so adopting a term already given prominence by Surawardi, Ibn Arbi refers to these names as the barjak between creature and creator, that is the bridge or the isthmus, uh, kind of bridge and creature and creator. As he explains the divine names, quote, look upon him, Allah, since they name him, and they look upon us, since they bestow upon us effects attributed to the named, that is Allah. So they make the named known and they make us known. In other words, they're an isma that goes both ways. Um, that I think is a very, um, you know, pregnant concept. Um, and I would like to know more actually about some of the applications and how he develops this. But just based on what I do know, it sounds to me a lot, an awful like the divine processions. Um, and he even has that same terminology that Dionysius has that, you know, every divine procession is a divine name, goodness, beauty, love, what have you. Um, seems there's something similar here, and each one is a way in which God is manifesting himself, although he remains at the same time beyond that manifestation, right? Because he's its source, you can't simply identify him with that. Um, mm -hmm. So for Dionysius, the end, there's the super substantial divine essence, and then there are the processions. Okay, that's how he terms that. But it seems mm -hmm. like there's something, you know, for Ibn Arabi, the divine essence or unity on the one hand, whereas you have the divine manifestation in the attributes or names on the other hand. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, that would be a, a definite parallel. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, do you know, maybe not, you probably know more about Ar Ibn Arabi than I do. And do you think that, that that's legitimate to see a, a kind of convergence of thought there? Yeah, no, I definitely think that they are closely related. Um, I think that even speaking more broadly about the Islamic tradition in general, compared to the Eastern uh, Christian perspective in this case, I would see that the, the real fundamental difference is obviously between uh, the Trinity on the one hand and you know, our conception of God, uh, we wouldn't even use the words really single person, but just for the sake of bridging the gap, a single person on the other hand, I think that's largely where the difference would be. And even our scholars, when they speak about what they think is wrong in the Christian conception, is not that there are more than one uh, distinct attribute within God. That's not really the problem. The problem that we see or that the scholars generally would see is that it seems as though uh, Christian theology has taken what would be considered for us an attribute of God and, and kind of personalized it into a separate thing. Like the word is the sun, for example, uh, or you have the same thing with the spirit in with power and stuff like that. So. That's where I think the real difference for us is that some of the attributes or what we would consider traditionally attributes have become separate persons. And so that's where I think the real divide is, or at least the meaningful one is uh, between the two traditions in this case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I understand. Uh course it's not all the attributes in, mm -hmm. for Christians it's just the logos right and the Holy Spirit um, and so what then you know within the Ibn Arabi or, or this more Sufi framework what is the divine activity okay that's that's sort of the question I have is um, if it's not just identical with Allah how do we think of it What's, you mean what's good, yeah, the thing that he's doing, that God is doing actively to create and sustain creatures and uh, to be present among them or manifest in all these different forms, uh, mm -hmm. these different, you know, they're, for which they're different attributes, is activity just, I mean, you could think of it as another attribute, um, but it seems like it is 
you know, for that's where energia is for us. Uh, it's sort of this master concept in which we then see goodness and beauty and so on as forms of that. Um, mm -hmm. And so yeah, we would call them we would we would call them attributes of action. So um, and I'm just going to read them what they are. There there are eight attributes of action: judging, punishing, forgiving, providing, fashioning, rewarding, honoring, and creating. So we would see these as, you know, in our terminology, attributes of action by which we come to know God and who God is, because we would share the same idea or similar idea with um, the Eastern Christian tradition in the sense that God's essence is ultimately unknowable. Um, so we know God, as you, you quoted from Ibn Arabi, um, even though I'm not a follower of his, but in the same vein, we know God through his attributes and, and his names. And some of those attributes are related to his activity. Um, things like creating and sustaining the world, as you said. And so that's a way in which in this life, we're able to know God and relate to him. Yeah. Attributes of activity. Okay. Well, fair enough. I, um, yeah. So far as the Trinity goes, just to come back to that, um, so here's another question. What about the Quran being eternal? Um, isn't that, I mean, I know it's not a person, obviously, but isn't that something, sort of God's word that's eternally existing from him, uh, even prior independently of creation? Uh, you said independently of God? Or? Independently of creation. Oh, okay. You want to say something? Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to interject and say um, with the attributes of action, just to throw this into the mix, my understanding from my reading of the Ashari sources is that even those attributes of action are all eternal, including creating and judging and all these ones. That's That's been my understanding from my reading. So I just want that, I think that might be a point of difference as well. And then I know Kai is in the comments asking about CASP, which we can go on to later, but which is a separate idea of like God creating the actions of creatures and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. But I just wanted to throw those in just as concepts, um, which we could talk about as well as the, the Quran and etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, actually for people like Juaini and uh, Ghazali, uh, who were uh, some, of the, some of the most prominent Ashari uh, scholars, um, they actually wouldn't say that. They would say that uh, God's attributes of actions are temporal. They're not eternal. Um, but there is there is actually a difference of opinion on it. Um, so, for example, um, in the Mataridi uh, tradition, which is very closely related to the Asharis, there's only a few substantive differences. Um, they would say that these attributes of action are eternal. Um, so there is difference of opinion on that, and you can take it either way. Um, yeah, so I don't know if that helps answer your question, Lewis. Yeah, yeah, because I, I, I've been reading the I, attributes of action as the queen. That was what I'd been reading as, and that was the, an attribute that's eternal, or for the Ashari, they don't think that, they think something else. So, yeah, I just wanted to throw that mm -hmm. in. Um, yeah, I actually have a I actually have a good book here uh, that I would recommend if you guys. It's called the uh, the differences between the Asheris and Maturidis. Uh, it's by a prominent scholar today, um, Sheikh uh, Saeed Foda. Uh, he's an Ashari, but he goes through the um, there's like twelve basic differences between the two of them, and I think that's point number four. Let me just check real quick. Because that's one of the differences. Um, oh, it's actually point number one. The attribute of creation or taqween. Uh, there's a difference of opinion on that. So you can find that in page 32. It's a short book. It's only like 80 pages long. And it kind of in a neat way summarizes some of these points. Um, so, yeah, you can see that there's a difference on that. Um, but, Dr. Bradshaw, back to your question about the Quran and the eternal speech of God, I think that there's a little bit of either misunderstanding or miscommunication a lot of times when I see 
uh, discussions on this issue between Christians and Muslims. And for us, we make a distinction between what's called kalam nafsi and kalam lovdi, which is basically the, di the difference is um, God's speech, which is eternal, that's in of himself. It doesn't have letters or sounds. It's just pure meaning in the mind of God. And then we have uh, Kalam Lavdi, which is basically um, the Quran that we have here that we would hold in our hands that has letters, sounds, and these kind of created um, things. And so there's a distinction between the two. And I can just read you a quote um, from the same book that I read uh, in which both of these major key figures, Al-Maturidi and Al-Ashari, agree on this. And, and the author says, According to both al-Maturidi and al-Ashari, the actual pre-eternal attribute, speaking about God's word or speech, does not make contact with a sense organ or vice versa. Hence, both of them negated the creator being connected with the creation, and this is a fundamental tenet. Furthermore, both of them negated the connection of the pre-eternal attribute with the creation or its indwelling within it. And this is another fundamental tenet. Hence, there was no disagreement between them on this issue. So he is saying that there's no difference of opinion between these two thinkers who make up the, the large portion of the tradition, uh, those who follow them, on the difference between what we would say is the pre-eternal speech that is an eternal attribute and then what actually manifests into creation there's a difference between the two. Hmm. So uh, to say that the Quran is eternal and uncreated, uh, maybe it's kind of ambiguous, depending on whether we yeah, mean. Yeah, it depends, it, depends, it depends what you mean by that, yeah. Hmm. So if you're talking about the Kalam Nefsi, which is this eternal um, thing in the mind of God that is just pure meaning without sounds and letters and stuff like that, then we would agree that is eternal but then how it's kind of manifests into creation in the form of letters and sounds, we would say that that is um, created in some sense. Yeah. Well, anyway, it does sound like then there is a, con a sort of a concept of the eternal word of God. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, even though it's sort of implicit and not articulated distinctly in different sounds or words or what have you, um, so that's part of the way, I mean, toward the Christian view, obviously not the whole way. Um, now, I'm, for what it's worth, my, my opinion is, well, there's not a philosophical proof of the Trinity. Um, you know, some people have attempted that. Um, and, yeah, Bo did in our, in our last oh, did, Okay. <laughs> well, maybe I should read what Bo's version is before I speak too quickly. Yeah. But Yeah, I, he, uh, gave, never... he, he gave an ontological proof, ultimately. Uh -huh. I don't think it was successful, and um, we talked about it. Maybe we'll have a round two discussion on that. Um, but I'm sure you're you're familiar with even people like uh, Swinburne's argument from love and the whole thing with Richard mm -hmm. and Saint uh, Victor. I, I don't. Um, I'm not really persuaded by either of those arguments. I think that they're flawed in in different ways. Um, but. One question I did have for you about the Trinity, because there was this interesting quote that I picked up from your uh, book, um, where you said, Athenagoras, Clement, and Athanasius refer to the Son as the energy of the Father, and Athanasius refers to the Holy Spirit as the energy of the Son. Um, and I'm just wondering from you, uh, you went on to further kind of dispel that notion in, in a strict sense that they meant in that way. But I'm wondering from you, because I think you settled on the view that they're not energies of the Father, even though they, they um, are generated by the Father. Um, so I'm wondering, in those, uh, in those authors, in those fathers that you quoted, did use this term for them in that sense? What do you think they were trying to convey by that, and what do you think they meant? Well, in, this, in Athenagoras, you know, he's one of the Greek apologists. Mm -hmm. um, so if I remember correctly, for him, it's it's a way of stating 
that view you find in a number of the Greek apologists that distinguishes the logos and the authetos with the look from the logos prophoricos. Uh, the logos and the being the, the eternal word of God that's eternally laid up, so to speak, in the bosom of the Father, much like what you were describing, actually, uh, you know, the eternal meaning and sort of content of the divine thought. And then for them, uh, these Greek apologists, that logos then comes forth when God creates. Mm -hmm. And that's the logos prophoricos, uh, mm -hmm. the, the uttered word, spoken word. And of course, that fits very nicely with God creating by speaking in the book of Genesis. So they take that rather literally, you know, that the word comes forth and God speaks and, and things come into being. Um, mm -hmm. And so the, you know, you can see how in that kind of a view, that logos prophoricos, that uttered word would be a kind of energia and activity of the father, something the father does, performs, and you know, a work he performs that is also something real and actual. Um, and so it would be one way of kind of using these terms. Uh, it ultimately was not kind of, it didn't become the standard orthodox way because uh, it, it seems to then diminish the reality and distinction of the son from the father. And that was really the issue, not only with that term, but even with that general distinction of logos and diothetos, logos prophoricos, tying that to the act of creation uh, mm -hmm. was something generally not done, at least after Nicaea. Um, mm -hmm. Now, for what it's worth, though, there is a really interesting passage in Maximus the Confessor um, in the Ambigua, where he, the way he puts it is in terms of successive uh, thickenings of the logos. Uh, so he uses the, a, a little bit more neutral terminology in a way when he talks about thickening, but uh, he says that the first thickening of the Logos is when God creates, because that's when the Logos is uttered and uh, calls things into being. And uh, that's just the first one, though. The second thickening is when God gives commandments to Moses. Uh, the law is a thickening of the Logos, because now God's intent for creation has been articulated into a set of distinct commandments to live by. And then the incarnation, when the word becomes man, is the final thickening of the logos, a kind of successive, you know, concentration and thickening again, uh, just more and more focused and fully present, you might say, at each stage. Um, uh, at any rate, so that's sort of the survival of that idea from the Greek apologists and a later thinker. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so, and the same thing with the Holy Spirit being the energia of the Son. Um, you can see why someone might think that because uh, it is true that Jesus says in the Gospel of John that I will send you the, the, the Spirit, the Comforter, um, and he will bring you into all truth and so on. Um, so it seems like something he's doing. And you could take that to mean that the Spirit is a kind of activity performed by God the Son. But again, that would kind of diminish his separate distinct reality. And so that's where the ter other terms like hypostasis, of course, become very important uh, mm -hmm. to clarify that. Mm -hmm. Now, can I just ask you about the divine procession since we're on that subject? Um, you did say in your comments just now that the, in some sense, the, the son and the spirit are works or, you know, activities of the father. Now, I'm just wondering, in your view, if it's an action that is of necessity or will? Um, yeah, so, so again, the, see, the orthodox terminology, ultimately, at least from the time of Athanasius, is they're not energies or works of the Father. They're uh, distinct persons, apostasies, uh, and they come forth in different ways, of course, begetting a procession. Um, so the question is, are those acts acts of necessity or of will? And that, of course, you know, that's that was a challenge raised by uh, Arius himself against people like Athanasius. And Athanasius addresses that um, toward the end of his orations against the Arians, um, where he says roughly, well, uh, neither of the above. If by will we mean 
choice and something that could have been chosen otherwise. It's not that God chooses or God the Father chooses to beget the Son, but it's also not necessary if by that we mean something that he is compelled to do. He says there it's by nature. Okay, and so he he locates this tertium quid of acts that are by nature, um, such as being good. Uh, for God to be good is not by will. It's not like he could choose not to be good. But it's also not necessary in the sense that he's compelled. It's rather simply his nature to do so. Uh, so uh, that's sort of the parallel Athanasius draws to say, well, God, the Father begets by nature. And he distinguishes that from the act of creation, which, of course, is by will. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that, by the way, is one of the places where you can see in the Greek fathers that the distinction between the divine nature or essence and the divine will is really crucially important because otherwise, how do you sustain the distinction between begetting and creating uh, mm -hmm. as Athanasius mm -hmm. does? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the only problem that I see is that it does kind of, to me, it does seem like a true dichotomy um, because on the one hand, if these actions are necessary, then it doesn't seem that the father is ultimately free. And on the other hand, if it's by will and by choice, then it seems as if um, the the son and the spirit are contingent and, and we don't want to say that either. So mm -hmm. it does seem to me like a real problem because even if you change the language to say that it's by nature, it, it almost, in, in other words, it's almost as if you're saying it's by his essence, it gives the impression that it is necessary. It seems that it would lean more closely to that um, horn of the, the, of the dilemma rather than the latter one of it being by will. It seems more closely related with an act of necessity. Now, I do know that I, I watched um, another interview you had where you mentioned that you were I think working on a paper or working on something related to the subject of um, acts of nature. Do I have that right? Hmm. Doesn't ring a bell. Um, um, acts of nature, unless that that just means things like God being good. Um, mm -hmm. You know. So so yeah. For what it's worth, you know, toward the end of of my book in the epilogue, I do talk about how yeah, some of the divine energies are necessary. And that's true because if God, you know, if if the processions in Dionysius, for instance, are forms of divine energy, well, God could never be without goodness, mm -hmm. nor without being, nor without life, nor without wisdom. Um, so that those are eternal and necessary in that sense, yes. Um, um, even though then the further form that they take in creation is not necessary and is contingent. Okay, so you can have the same divine procession sort of manifesting itself in various ways at different levels, so to speak, in God himself and among creatures. Um, so I don't see a problem with saying that some things are necessary to God. I mean, many things are necessary to God, being life, goodness. And uh, yeah, in Christian thought, it's necessary that the father begets the son. Um, if by necessary, we simply mean could not be otherwise. Uh, mm -hmm. But if we mean by necessary, compelled, uh, forced, mm -hmm. of course it's not. Okay, mm -hmm. no more than it's forced to be good. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, obviously, I, well, I shouldn't say obviously, but I'm under the impression that you wouldn't be comfortable with using the language that the Son and the Spirit are attributes of God, right? Right, yeah. Okay, so because I, I've i seen on this channel and I've seen in other uh, sort of Christian polemics um, of trying to use the Islamic framework of how we speak about attributes and make that somehow analogous to the persons in the Trinity. And I don't really think it's analogous because we use the word attribute and you guys don't. And I think we mean two different things, 
two different things when you talk about the distinctness of the son and the spirit as persons than as we do with the attribute. And as I just explained, like when you compare um, God's knowledge or God's word in terms of the Quran as pure meaning, it's I think it's obviously different than a distinct word like the sun. I think we're talking about two different things. And so I just want us to be wary of that comparison. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. They're not persons. I mean, as I understand what you're saying, yeah. um, uh, the only compa comparison I think we could draw is the one that I was mentioning earlier about how it seems like there is a concept of the eternal word. Of, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, at least, if, given that I don't really, my belief in the Trinity doesn't rest on a philosophical argument. Um, mm -hmm. So for me, it's a matter of, uh, frankly, <laughs> a great surprise uh, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Um, mm -hmm. No philosopher had ever conceived of that, you know. <laughs> um, even, even Philo of Alexandria, you know, who does have a lot to say about the divine logos. And it's very interesting how much he anticipates Christian thought about the divine logos. Um, mm -hmm. He never conceives the logos becoming flesh and becoming mm -hmm. a man. And it's only when he does so, you know, in the gospels that then, and we see him speaking to the father, praying to the father, that then that's what gives rise to the uh, to the distinction or the concept that these are in fact distinct persons. Mm -hmm. um, so really that's to me the watershed moment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so you would say it's a matter of revelation obviously rather than you know, philosophical reflection or some kind of independent argument to get you there. Um, I, I appreciate that. Um, but I am wondering, because you did talk about um, Plotinus and the whole um, Neoplatonism, there seems to be, stri at least from my perspective, striking similarities between um, Plotinus's um, conception of the one and the intellect and the soul uh, with the Trinity. And I don't, obviously I don't think there's a one for one correspondence, but I think if we were going to make any comparison to the Trinity, it would be more similar to that than some of the things that we hear of like related to the ancient Greek gods and, and you know, how some people try to make that comparison. I don't think that's fair at all, but I do think it is somewhat related because it almost seems as if the father is uh, somewhat synonymous to the one in that he doesn't become incarnate. And I've heard even some Eastern Orthodox go as far to say that he couldn't become incarnate um, and that that's something unique to the son. And then the spirit is even kind of more intimately related. Um, so what do you make of that comparison? Well, it, it's, it's a striking fact that there were plenty of triadic schemes in Greek philosophy in those early centuries AD. I mean, even before Plotinus, in the Middle Platonists, they'd often distinguish sort of the highest god and then the uh, subordinate god who is the demiurge. And then, for instance, in, in uh, Alcanus, I think then the third god is the world soul. Um, and in my book, in, in chapter... Um, Oh, what is it? Chapter th three, where I talk about Numenius and Alcanus. You know, I describe those schemes that they have. Um, yeah, but all those schemes are subordinationist. In other words, you, there's a distinct ranking and priority. Um, and you can see when Christians, uh, the way I read that history is what happens is that Christians fundamentally have the Gospels, right? And the epistles of uh, the rest of the New Testament. That's 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 the basis of revelation. And then the work of theology is trying to figure out what this all means and how do we how do we phrase it sort of in, a, in somewhat a creedal form, something kind of a formula that will summarize what's implied here. And that effort takes centuries because um, the early forms of Trinitarian thought largely are subordinationist. You know, I mentioned the uh, the Greek apologists and their their way of understanding the logos and diothetos and prophoricos, that makes the distinct existence of the word as a separate person something that hinges upon the act of creation. 
And that's why it was ultimately rejected um, as not really adequate to maintain or safeguard that distinct identity. But it was an, a plausible attempt, you know. And uh, Arianism, I would, I would view that way as well. It was a plausible attempt um, to talk about, to understand who is God the Word. Uh, for Arius, he was a creature, the first of all creatures through whom God created everything else. Um, but um, again, that's not adequate to make him fully God. And that was really Athanasius's point. You know, it's, it's, it's the Christian understanding of salvation and how salvation works. Um, it requires that Christ is fully God. And mm -hmm. so uh, that was the fundamental argument that, Ath that Athanasius made against Arius. And from that point, people realized that uh, none of these subordinationist schemes are going to work for Christian mm -hmm. theology. And they have to be equal to God. And that's, of course, what the Nicene Creed affirms. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's really where orthodoxy kind of crystallizes into creedal form. Yeah. But that's not to well, deny that. You know, this, Triadic schemes, you know, they were out there and they probably had some influence. Sure. Right, right. Now you mentioned the Nicene Creed. Uh, Lewis, if I could just ask one more question and then we could move on. Um, mm -hmm. with, with the Nicene Creed, it explicitly states that the, the Son is begotten eternally of the Father. Um, and in my understanding, the language that even St. Gregory would use is that uh, he has no problem using the word cause. And when I speak to other lay Christians about this issue, and I, you know, I, I read the creed for them, this even happened in a, a debate or discussion I had a couple weeks ago, um, where I said that the word gotten in that, in that context, if you look at what the, the fathers actually wrote about it, they didn't have any problem with using it somewhat synonymously with cause. And it seems as though a lot of lay Christians have a problem with that language of cause. So I just would like to know from you if I'm interpreting that properly and why they shouldn't actually be worried about using the word cause as long as we understand it as eternal and it's not a creation. They don't mean cause in terms of creation, but they do use the word cause. So. Um, I'm just wondering if my interpretation of the creed and the fathers is correct, and what do you think they actually meant by cause, and why should we not think that that's problematic? Yeah. Well, you know, so the concept, we translate cause, uh, aetion or aetia, you've got those two Greek terms that both come out of a legal context, where the aetia is sort of the explanatory account of why someone committed this crime, how this crime happened. And the Aetion is the actual agent who committed the crime, or at least they're, they're accusing of committing the crime. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the father is the Aetion uh, and the Aetia, both of mm -hmm. the son in, in those senses that, yeah, um, to explain the existence of the son, you have to refer to the father. That's really implied in those very terms, son and father, right? The son, a mm -hmm. son is always going to be the son of a father. And mm -hmm. uh, that the father uh, is the aition, you know, the originating cause of the son. Uh, and as far as I can guess, you know, the only reason people might shy away from those terms is if, they're, if their concept of cause is influenced by uh, sort of Humean or post-Humean ideas in which a cause is always prior to the effect temporally yeah. and distinct events or distinct existence, you know, little billiard balls hitting each other, that sort of thing. And we're not yeah. talking about that. We're talking about, yeah. you know, the flame and its radiance. That's the analogy they always use. Um, mm -hmm. Two things that exist together eternally, but nonetheless, one is the cause of the other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even C.S. Lewis, I think, and I don't know if you're happy with this analogy, but he gives the idea of books, um, one propping the other up eternally. And so that, you know, there's no um, temporal relationship of any kind. I just think that, as you said, um, when people hear the word cause, their minds may automatically go to something temporal or some kind of temporal mm -hmm. action. 
And that's not what's meant by the term. It's this eternal uh, relationship, it's sort of like what C.S. Lewis explains of one book propping the other up. And as you said, also with the, um, the flame example. So, okay. I just wanted to clear that up because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't misrepresenting. And I, I didn't, I didn't try to give the impression like in the other previous discussion, like this was a gotcha moment of any sort, because I know that, you know, whether they use were whether they use the word cause or not, they certainly did not imagine something temporal. It was an eternal thing. Right. Right. So, okay. Yeah, that notion of eternal causation mm -hmm. uh, was kind of, uh, was out there commonly already within Middle Platonism. You know, with these three gods, for instance, all that is eternal as well. Right. Um, right. So, yeah. Right. All right, Lewis. I'll turn it over to you if you want to ask a couple questions. Had any more questions for Jake before we do a, um, a Q and A? No, no, that's great. Um, appreciate uh, uh, you know what you've said so far. So, yeah. Um, so the first question is um, Kai asks a question for Jake. Uh, how do you relate Dr. Bradshaw's explanation of God's activity in creatures and their consequent actions to the Islamic concept of kas or iktisab, the acquisition of of action? How do you relate Dr. Bradshaw's explanation of God's activity in creatures and their consequent actions to the Islamic concept of kasp? Um, I'm not sure I really understand the question all that well. I think he might, think he might be asking something like, um, when Brad, Dr. Bradshaw explained uh, God's activity in creatures, like for example, um, um, mm -hmm. God, God is really synergetically acting with the creature, and there's so some mm -hmm. so the action of God is uncreated, and the action of the creature is you know is is created. But in in the Islamic view, it's like every single action that happens in creation is just is created. That like because in the Islamic view, God can't. It seems to me God can't really synergize with creatures. I was just wondering if you because what happens in Casp is the the creature has an intention. To do something and then Allah creates that action in the creature for them to act out mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. evil actions and uh, good mm -hmm. actions I'm wondering mm -hmm. if, if there's any interplay there that you see or that maybe dr bradshaw um, might think of yeah i guess this hinges on your view of occasionalism um I would say that there's a recent attempt to kind of explain this by uh, Dr. Nazif. Uh, he's a Turkish scholar. Um, he gives a uh, version of, of um, Al Maturidi's perspective on this. Um, and I think it kind of comes down to whether or not you think um, a human's intention is a thing uh, and whether or not that's created by God because it kind of just pushes the step back uh, a step further. Um, so I don't know, it would be a little bit difficult for me to answer that because I don't think I have all that of an, uh, a settled view per se on the issue of exactly how to think about it because as I'm sure Kai might know, there's difference of opinion on this. I mean, you had figures like Ibn Rushd who believed that um, men had their own actions in time and so they were able to, whether or not he uses the word create is another thing, but they were able to have effects in the real world. Um, so I think it's open to take that position if one likes. Um, I would just say I don't really have a settled view on that specific issue at the moment, but I, I do lean more towards the Maturidi perspective, and I would just refer you to Dr. Nazif's paper where he tried to kind of sketch out an explanation of how it works. It's a bit complicated to explain in like two yeah. minutes. Could I just ask you, is that uh, Nassif Mutaruglu? Yes, uh, yes, yes. Okay, yeah. Yeah, he was, he was a grad student in our program. Um, oh, nice. And I was on his, on his uh, dissertation committee back in the day. And yeah, he's, he's a great uh, proponent of occasionalism, as I'm mm -hmm. sure you know. He's done a lot of really nice work on that subject. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, he has a whole website out there 
uh, I forget the name of it, but um, it's all about occasionalism. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'd be interesting to to get him to dig into the subject himself a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a real, a, a wonder, a fine person. I mean, I probably enjoyed knowing him while he was here. Oh wow, yeah, I never knew that you guys had a relationship. That's that's cool. Yeah, he gave me a big annotated copy of the Quran too. So, oh, <laughs> <laughs> he's trying that's to nice. set, set me straight. <laughs> so, <laughs> I always appreciate that. Uh, this is a question I'm not from Muhammad Hanif. I'm not exactly sure the first. He, he asks, what determines, it seems to me, what determines the energies that God has? Wouldn't he be in some way ontologically dependent on um, reason? Uh, and then wouldn't God be dependent? I, I wonder if this has to do with the pluralization of energies. Mm -hmm. Logically, yeah. prior to your, that's, that's how I'm, I'm reading that. So, yeah, Hanif, you've got to do a better job typing, buddy. <laughs> you got it. You got a lot of errors in there. And no but, problem. Uh, I, I, yeah. I get the point. I mean, yeah. So if there was, if there were anything that determined God to have certain energies, then that would be right that there'd be something prior to God. Um, but it's simply himself, you know, it's his own nature. And um, again, if you think of the energies that are necessary to God, their goodness, being life, wisdom, power, unity, holiness, uh, et cetera. And so uh, I think it's a similar issue with, you know, those eternal attributes that uh, Jake was talking about with uh, Allah, that there too, it's not something external is acting upon God to make him have these attributes. He just does. That's who he is. That's his nature. And um, that's true for these energies. Uh, the thing that maybe is different or that might be confusing is that the there are also other energies that are contingent okay and the concept of energy is sort of this big umbrella concept that can include some that are contingent some that are necessary and um uh the greek fathers just really weren't troubled by that to them it really wasn't an issue because they always understood that i think some things about god are true necessarily and many others are true only contingently mm -hmm. Right. So you would you wouldn't be comfortable with saying that God is a composite or made of parts or anything like that. Right. Oh, yeah, no. so we, we would agree because I think I would say that even essential attributes are not parts of God in the sense that typically we think of parts as things that are able to be separated and essential attributes aren't that sort of thing that could be separated and exist independently of god and so i think arguments for absolute divine simplicity kind of have a smuggled in concept of what it means to be parts that i guess both of us would just reject mm -hmm. yeah yeah that whole concept i mean god doesn't have parts i think that's something uh pretty much everyone who thinks about it seriously is going <laughs> to draw that mm -hmm. conclusion because mm -hmm. then you've got the question, well, what put the parts together? Right. Right. So, yeah. right. Unless you're uh, maybe a, an, a hardline athari or anthropomorphist. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, yeah, if you want to go that route, I mean, <laughs> yeah, but I would, I would defend, e I think, to be honest with you, uh, um, the traditional athari position, the difference between the Asharis and the Atharis is that it's just a number of how many attributes you want to say there are. So typically the, the Asharis, especially the later ones, would reduce what we would call the anthropomorphic attributes to the rational attributes. So they would take something like God's hands and say, well, it, there's not this like physical thing that is God's hand. It's something akin to power and it's just another way of god stating that whereas the atheries the traditional ones and there may have been some now that kind of misuse this understanding they would say no we want to keep the word hand and would negate any anthropomorphism with that there's nothing like god in that sense but whatever this hand is it's a distinct attribute from power that does not associate any anthropomorph anthropomorphism with it. And so, but there are, I do agree with you, there are some people who have 
taken it a step further and and kind of hint at anthropomorphism and you can read that certainly um people in the tradition and a lot of maybe a lot of people who are misinformed today i think even uh misrepresent some of these figures yeah i mean the, the author you mentioned earlier sheikh uh, saeed fuda he in mm-hmm. his book uh, on the sanusi creed he rails well, in the whole introduction pretty much rails against the anthropomorphists yeah in the islamic community so yeah mm-hmm. um so here's a question um we've got like five minutes left uh, this is from uh kieran he says question dr bradshaw what's your thoughts uh for the philosophical argument that a many enhanced being the argument of one and many uh do you think islam could account for the one and the many Okay, well, uh, so that question takes a little interpretation, but let me say what I think is they're getting at. Um, So the old question in Greek philosophy is if the ultimate first principle is one and simply one and has no parts, purely simple, how can there be many things? How could could that one ever give rise to many? Um, You know, and Plotinus, I think, has a pretty severe form of this problem because for him the one of course is primary and is the cause of all and that's where his theory of emanation um invokes the theory of two acts you may you know if you look at my book i have a chapter about that chapter four where he says that every substance every you see it insofar as it is perfect and complete naturally gives rise to some kind of a of an external act that is its image. And he uses the example of fire giving rise to heat and snow giving rise to cold. You know, he, he thought of cold as sort of a real thing, not just the absence of heat, but a real thing that comes from cold snow uh, or ice. And uh, the scent coming from perfume is another example he uses. Um, well, so that's an interesting approach and it's probably the best you can do, but you'll notice he's then invoking a sort of a universal causal law and framework that itself derives from our knowledge of the many, and he's applying it to the one, um, which is a real tension for Plotinus because you're really not supposed to be able to do that in Plotinus. The one is not, you know, it has no form. It actually is not an usia at all. So how can it be any help to take a law that's true of the CI in general and uh, apply, it, apply it to the one? Uh, in my opinion, that's really an unresolved issue in Plotinus. Um, but again, it's probably the best you can do given the clear fact that yes, there are many. And if you think that the, the ultimate explanation has to be the one, then you know, you've got this issue. And so uh, that's how he addresses it. Anyway, so far as the question goes, I think they're kind of asking, so does the Trinity give us a better handle on that issue? Um, I'm inclined to say yes, okay? I I don't want to take that to the extent of saying, therefore, we can prove that God has to be Trinitarian from the fact that there are many. Um, What's really needed, at least, is the plurality of creative intent, you know, that God wills there to be many things. And it's not obvious to me that that can't be true if you think of God in the Islamic way. Um, But at least I know, I think thinking of him in the Christian way, there's really not a problem because you've already got that plurality within the Trinity and plural objects in the sense, both the Father, the the Son and the Holy Spirit are both objects of the Father's knowledge and love uh, and will and so forth. Um, so that's already true eternally. And then God's creation is, uh, I mean, the other thing that's true in the Trinity that's very important is that love is there eternally and that intra-Trinitarian love. And so creation then is a, is an, is a further manifestation of what's already present in the Trinity, that eternal divine love. Um, now, Jake, you may want to comment here. I mean, my understanding of Islamic thought is that's, you can't really speak of there being that kind of love. And so creation, even if it's true that, you know, so creation occurs out, out of the spontaneity of divine will, all right? And there's nothing inhibiting God from creating many creatures. Um, mm-hmm. Still, it's, it's hard to see that 
what it is what is sort of the element of continuity between the creative act and what God is antecedently to that. Uh, in other words, it's hard to see how creation is sort of just a further exemplification of what he already is and what he eternally, you know, relates to internally, so to speak. Um, just curious. I mean, that's that's where I would go with that question. I wonder if you have any thoughts. Um, well, there's a couple different threads. Um, as far as the one and the many, I think, as you explained before about uh, Imam Ghazali, I think he does a good job of explaining just that by the fact that we do uh, see different things in creation. Um, we can explain that, I, I think anyway, just as easily. Um, now with the issue of love, of course, there's not two other persons or three persons that God is eternally loving. But I think, I don't think that you're persuaded by Swinburne's argument. So if you're not persuaded by that, I don't see any difficulty for the Islamic conception of God, especially if God perfectly loves himself in the fact that he himself is perfect. He's an infinite being. And so the object of which he loves, which is himself, would be perfect. And I don't see any uh, problem with that necessarily. Um, so, yeah, that's what I would say about mm -hmm. that anyway. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. I, like I said, I don't really see a uh, an absolute hurdle there. Um, for what it's worth, though, I do think there's a difference in the way that these two bodies of thought are thinking about the status of creation. Um, and this may also be why I think occasionalism, you know, is much more of a mainstream view in Islam, or at least Sunni Islam, than it is in Christianity, where it does exist, but of course it's kind of a marginal view. Um, because in Christianity, like I said, um, there's a certain continuity between the act of creation and what God is antecedently, in which it's just sort of the natural thing for God to do, given that he is love. And um, he already sort of delights in the knowledge, you might say, of the other. Okay, that's a key issue or a key way to kind of approach that is that um, uh, in, in Trinitarian thought, goodness necessarily takes the form of love and delight in the separate reality of another. Um, and therefore, the act of creation, even though it's not necessary, is fully natural and kind of a, uh, an extension of what God already is. And it seems like for Islam that that's not true. And so there's more of a kind of a radical break in which creation is simply something wholly other and dependent. And um, I don't want to, it's not arbitrary, okay, but I would wonder, well, then what reason God has to create? You know, if, if there's not already that antecedent relation to the other, that's part of the, an eternal aspect of the divine being. I think there's a problem, uh, or there's a different question that each um, religion has to answer. On the Christian side, since you already have these three persons existing in a sort of perfect relationship, the question is, why would God even need to create to begin with? Um, and so I think that's the question um, that's a question on the Christian side. The difficulty on the Muslim side would be, well, with this idea of love and certain other attributes, uh, it seems a little bit um, less fleshed out on the Muslim conception. And, and so there almost seems like a need to create almost. And so I think those are the where we kind of diverge. And I wouldn't say so much problems, but we have two different questions to answer as to it seems more difficult to answer why the Christian God would need to create. And it makes more sense why the Islamic God would. Um, but then you have this other issue that you have to consider about some of God's attributes and how they make sense eternally on the Islamic conception. So I don't think that it really... Um, is a defining blow either way. I just think it's two different questions that 
each person has to answer. But I do want to comment actually what you said about occasionalism because I think some people may have um, the wrong impression. Although I do agree that the majority uh, position amongst the Sunnis is occasionalism. But uh, there's a famous Ashari uh, scholar named uh, Imam Razi. Uh, and he explains this issue. He says, I'm just going to quote, he says, as for what is known by inference from proof to be his religion, such as whether God knows by virtue of his attribute or knowledge, or rather by virtue of his entity, or whether or not he may be seen in the next life, or whether or not he creates the actions of his servants, we do not know by incontestably numerous chains of transmission, or what we would call teleter, that any of these alternatives has been affirmed by the prophet, peace be upon him, instead of the other. For each the truth of one and falsity of the other is known only through inference, so neither denial nor affirmation of it can enter into actual faith, and hence cannot entail unbelief or what we would call kufr or disbelief. So what he's saying is whether or not you take the occasionalist view or otherwise, it's not a definitive matter of the faith. You don't you know, leave Islam if you, if you reject that understanding. Although yeah. some people may present it that way, even in the tradition, but this is a, uh, a giant scholar of the tradition that is clearly disagreeing with that. Yeah. So I, would, I would say the same thing. I don't think it's a matter of disbelief. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you're right about that. Um, yeah, but just to... Just to 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 keep on with this just for another minute, uh, I mean, you don't really want to say that God needs to create, right? No, no, no. I wasn't saying that, but I was just saying that, given the Islamic conception of God and the lack of plurality of persons, that's the question that would be put to the Muslim uh, thinker. It, the Christian or a skeptic would say, well, it almost seems like God needs to create. Now, obviously, we would resist that, but I'm saying that's the type of questioning that someone would ask, would ask. And on the flip side, I would ask, like I would say, Dr. Bradshaw, well, since they have this perfect relationship in eternity, there seems like less of a reason for God to create. Um And like I said, I don't think either way that it's a definitive problem. Like I wouldn't um, base my uh, faith or belief on that sort of argument. But I do recognize that it's a different question that either position has to try to answer. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But ultimately, I don't think God needs to create. I think he's completely free. Uh, um, Ghazali is very clear about this. God didn't need to create at all. He could have. Uh, done anything you wanted. Yeah, well, that's what I thought. Um, I, I, you know, the question I was raising was more about what reason he has, um, and you, you know, one possible answer is well, no reason. He just wanted to, right? You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's it was an arbitrary act. Um, mm-hmm. That's a possible answer. I just, um, I think it, if one can give a reason, then that's better. That's preferable. Other things being mm-hmm. equal, and again, the Christian view is that it's. It's the nature of love, you know, it's the nature of love to seek to give itself to others. And so, yeah, the Trinity, God doesn't need to create. He doesn't have to. Nothing compels him. But uh, it's a natural thing to do. So they would distinguish between what's necessary and what's uh, sort of fitting and appropriate. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, So, but yeah, I'm not claiming by any means this is sort of a knockdown argument. It's just an important Mm -hmm thing to think about Mm -hmm. um, because I do think it affects the way you think about the status of creation you know that creation for us at least it's made to be an object of love that's the reason things exist uh, Mm -hmm. is because God loves us and therefore wants us to return to him you know and that's where the Neoplatonic idea is sort of a natural framework uh, to think in and if there's no reason God creates, then that wouldn't be true. And mm-hmm. you're left wondering, well, you know, so what's the point of it all anyway? Um, mm-hmm. That's all. And yeah, so, I mean, you quoted you quoted earlier from your article um, when I think it was Ibn Arabi that said uh, he he quoted the hadith um, that said, "I created in order that I might be known." 
Um, and it went on to explain about the divine names and that sort of idea. So I think that that idea is fully compatible with the Islamic conception of God. I don't see any problem with it whatsoever. But then I would also tack on to it that I think it's completely God's will. And I think you would agree with that in the same sense. And uh, Ghazali goes to the uh, basically explain that what God's will is, is the ability to discern between two like things. So we would say that ultimately it's completely God's will and he can do whatever he wants. But um, we do see reasons in the sense of um, what I just quoted from the Hadith and what you, even what you were saying. I don't think we would really have a problem with that whatsoever. Okay. Yeah, I think um, that I think that's a good place to to wrap up. Um, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for coming on, Dr. Bradshaw. It's been a real honor. Uh huh. Sure. Um, My pleasure. And, um, yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate the uh, conversation. Yeah. Yeah, and Lewis, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, uh, I see you've got something good going here. I mean, I'm I want to go back and read some of the chat now because there's just been a <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people with a lot of things to say. So, yeah, I saw uh, Dr. Yeah. Branson was in the chat too, right? <laughs> There's a lot of interesting questions, but I, I don't want to like, uh, you know, keep you here for four hours. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, so maybe somebody may be not pleased with the fact that I said I don't think there's a philosophical proof of the Trinity. So <laughs> yeah, you made it. You, you might have upset Dr. Branson a little. <laughs> well, I saw he was uh, in the chat there. He and I have been trading emails anyway on a different issue, so I'll let him yeah. uh, chastise me about that if, if needed. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Dr. So, okay. Brant, uh, Dr. Bradshaw, sorry. Um, is there anything that you're working on specifically right now coming up that we should look out for? Or? Uh, well, actually, since you mentioned Richard Swinburne, um, mm -hmm. he and I are co-editors of a volume um, that we're trying to kind of wrap up called Natural Theology in the Eastern Orthodox Tradition. Mm -hmm. and it's addressed, you know, more for an Eastern Orthodox audience, but also anybody interested in it, that um, what is the role of natural theology in Orthodoxy? It's a little different than it is in Western Christianity. I mm -hmm. think probably you might say more subordinate, but it is there. And mm -hmm. the question is sort of uh, what role do arguments for the existence of God have to play in relation to faith, in relation to other ways of knowing God? You know, orthodoxy has such an emphasis on the direct experience of God in the divine energies and, you know, through prayer, prayer of the heart, whatever. It's all um, mm -hmm. that a lot of times orthodox authors really emphasize that's how you come to know God and they subordinate mm -hmm. rational discursive reason. Um, so we want to kind of uh, look at the other side of that and say, yeah, but nonetheless, it's important. And why is it important and what role does it have? So. Mm -hmm. um, I'm surprised you guys are able to uh, collaborate on that almost. It seems like mm -hmm. from reading both of your material, almost as if you have a different answer to that question. So it's going to be interesting to see how you work through that. Yeah, uh, it's not finished yet. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, we have a lot of common ground. Um, uh, it's just that I sort of, my instinct is always to take my bearings from the church fathers, you know, so for me, if I want to kind of follow what they're saying and, and be faithful to that, they do give arguments for the existence of God. And yeah, uh, that's not a problem. I think Richard, for him, those arguments maybe are a little more important or at least more, you know, more relevant to our current situation. That's part of the issue. He, he sees a lot of really apologetic value in, those natural theological arguments. And I see some, but maybe not as much. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's that's the only uh, really uh, place there. I think there's a little difference between us. Mm -hmm. And he, I'm sure he hasn't persuaded you on the uh, the Richard argument yet, right? <laughs> the argument uh, from yet. love. Richard you know, I read that. and uh, Richard of uh, St. Victor, right? <laughs> yeah. I got to admit it. It's been a few years since I read it, so I need to go back and maybe I'll be persuaded the second time. But I don't think I was <laughs> when I first read it. Right. All right, Doctor uh, Brad. I really appreciate your time, and uh, Lewis, I appreciate you for hosting us. I think it was a very beneficial conversation.
enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you both.